we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. My name is Emily Shuckman Matthews, and I direct the European Studies Program. Um, welcome to our Imagine Europe event. Uh, the title is National Precarity in Post-Soviet Eurasian Comics, and I want to thank uh, this very collaborative effort throughout the university to bring Dr. Jose Alaniz to campus. Um, this is a, a collaborative event between the Department of European Studies, the Center for European Studies, the European Studies Program with Cal IRA funds, the Department of History, SDSU Comics, the Center for War and Society, and um, the SDSU Press. So thank you everybody for um, helping us bring Dr. Jose Alaniz to campus to talk about um, a wide range of issues. So Jose uh, Alaniz is a professor in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures and the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, Dr. Alaniz has published three monographs, Comics, Comic Art in Russia, that came out in 2010, Death, Disability, and the Superhero, The Silver Age and Beyond, 2014, and Resurrection, Comics in Post-Soviet Russia, which is the book on the, on the flyer. Um, he was a founding board member of the Comic Studies Society, and his current book projects include Comics of the Anthropocene, uh, Graphic Narrative at the End of Nature. In 2020, he published his first comics collection, The Phantom Zone and Other Stories, with Amatul Comics, at SDSU Press, and he lives blissfully with his wife and 25 animals in rural Washington state. So let's welcome Dr. Alanis. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a really important fact is that I'm, I'm in rural Washington and we have um, a homestead there um, and it's living in the country, which I started doing in 2019 and, and getting all the animals um, that really started started me on this on this project or really kind of confirmed me on this project that's dealing with uh, comics of climate change and mass extinctions and other kinds of uh, questions pertaining to the uh, the Anthropocene. So that that's certain, and that's what I was talking about uh, yesterday with another group of folks here. Today, though, I'm talking about um, material that is related to my uh, to the book that came out this year, um, which just deals with post-Soviet Russian comics, which basically means comics since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. But of course, there is a huge elephant in the room, and that is the war in Ukraine. Um, so that's really. Uh, for many of us in Slavic studies, those of us who are dealing with this region, uh, has um, really brought a, a moment of reckoning for us to deal with how we teach about Russia, how we approach Russian culture, to what extent maybe some of us have been enabling a, a, an imperialist Russian mindset. And, and so that is really informing uh, not only this talk, but pretty much everything that I'm doing now uh, in, in my work. Um, it, is, it is a real strange and, and and in many ways tragic time but first and foremost it, it's it's a tragic time for ukrainians and i think that that's where the focus always has to has to be uh you know and, and everything else is is secondary so that that's that's what is informing this talk um today which i call national precarity in post-soviet russian comics um so let me let's see so i just gotta do this i i should also warn you guys that some of the imagery uh, that I will show you. It is it is drawn. It is cartoons. It is comics. But it also uh, some of it is graphic. So um, we're we're dealing with images of violence and other kinds of trauma. So just be aware of that, please. So like I said, um, and as as uh, Dr. Shukman Matthews pointed out, that I've I've kind of uh, been working in the area of uh, Slavic and Russian and Eastern European comics for a while now. Um, so I have, in addition to my book that came out this year. Resurrection Comics in Post-Soviet Russia. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. I also have edited a collection that deals with what we call comics of the new Europe, um, meaning comics of the former Soviet bloc, uh, Eastern European comics. And uh, sadly, this is a, um, a pretty understudied area uh, to this day. Part of the problem is that there's just not many translations of this material, um, even though in, in, in their own countries, whether it's Poland, the Czech Republic, Romania, former Yugoslavian states, Ukraine, uh, there are flourishing comic scenes and comics cultures that, that are really, really worth exploring. Little by little, some of that material is starting to come out in English, but it's, um, 
it's still um, not not enough. And so, to the extent that 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 my work as a scholar can can hopefully get more attention on these things and maybe lead to more translations, uh, we're we're hoping that that will that will pay off in a, in a in a certain regard. As for my book, um, something that I labored over since about 2010. Uh, it picks up more or less where the story leaves off because my first book on Russian comics ends at about 2010. And in that book, I basically ended by saying, you know, there's wonderful comic art in Russia. There are wonderful people working on it, but there is no industry. There's really no venue. Um, there was a lot of resistance in Russian culture to the notion of comics, which for a long time, uh, even before the Soviet period, was regarded as a... Um, as an un-Russian art form and specifically an American art form. All of that changed as soon as I wrote my book. It, my book was almost uh, uh, immediately obsolete, partly because of things like the Marvel movies where you did start seeing a lot more of a, of a real comics industry in Russia. There was even an answer to Marvel comics in Russia called Bubble, which is specifically basically following that model. Um, and then the book comes out in, 20, in 2022 in February uh, and it is almost immediately obsolete again, because what has happened now is that the book comes out, it comes out the day before the war with Ukraine. And both with COVID, uh, the pandemic, and then also with the war has completely impacted not only the Russian comics industry, but the whole damn Russian economy, right? So the future is extremely uncertain and there's there's a lot of issues. So what you really have with, with both my first book on Russian comics and now this one on Russian comics is, is kind of relics. They're, they're kind of little time capsules about how things used to be, but they're no longer really um, up to date. So what I'm doing today is um, not even talking about Russian comics that much. I really wanna talk about the war and the way that comics artists in the region have been responding to it. And, and in a way, how in a kind of international uh, uh, scope, we have, uh, all sorts of ways in which this war is uh, is is upsetting the uh, the status quo. So first of all, let's just talk about very briefly about how those of us in the West have been reacting. So in addition to, of course, fundraising, uh, people putting out uh, obviously Ukrainian flags and all sorts of other things, and including projects like this, right, which is by um, Scott Dunbeer, who is a major voice in American comics, and IDW is an important press, and they put together a crowdfunded anthology, right, uh, that was comics for Ukraine, and you can see, right, it's really American in its approach. Um, it's got a, a superhero figure that's wearing the Ukrainian flag as its cape, and then you have some kind of giant there who's holding a hammer and sickle clearly representing Russia it's even red so you know it's Russia and so you know that that kind of of superhero idiom which is what you would expect from an Amer for an American market and and this anthology was very successful uh it raised a lot of money and it's and that you know no objections it's it's all great stuff but of course there's others within the region itself i'm talking about not just ukraine but within the um the post soviet uh, uh, space, right? Those former Soviet republics. I'm talking about places like Armenia, places like Georgia, uh, places like Ukraine, where you have, as I mentioned already, all sorts of flourishing comics cultures um, to, 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 to different degrees. So this project um, that I'm working on now, from which I'm deriving this talk, is, all, is I, I just wanted to, 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 to let you know that, this, that there's a larger kind of questions that I'm exploring. For example, right, the ways that Armenian comics artists really do a lot with the graphic novel to bring attention to the Armenian genocide of 1915. So the, the ways that history is kind of being used um, and, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to make fresh some very old uh, topics and very important nationalist uh, tropes. This is something that we've done in, in America, right, for a long time, Mouse being maybe the best example. Uh, or Persepolis, right, uh, by, by Satrapi uh, from, from uh, France, but she's also uh, 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 Persian and, and uh, Iranian. And then the other example that I give you guys is from Georgia, um, where, which is uh, basically a graphic novel, The Night in Panther Skin by David Machavariani, which is uh, basically putting into comics form a very old uh, Georgian national epic um, that goes back even before the Middle Ages. So it's, it's very much about using comics to talk about very old things. And the, uh, the gambit here is that it will make young people, people your age and younger, uh, more interested in, in these stories, right? Than, than they would be in reading about them in traditional texts. This is a very old, by the way, way of, of thinking about comics and how they are a, an art form for the young. 
Um, that's not always true because I'm old and I read comics, but you know what I mean. So um, one thing though that did come up in my interview with Machavariani who did that graphic novel, The Night in Panther Skin in 2019 has always stuck with me. And you might think of it as in a way a kind of epigraph for this talk. He says, he told me in the Soviet period, we had no comics in Georgia because it was considered capitalistic, but the world is developing. So we have to follow it. So comics came here also. It came first as something for kids. It's important to consolidate nationalism in Georgia after communism. We don't agree on anything as Georgians, but as Rustavelli, who is the, the national poet who is, who's, whose work he adapts, but Rustavelli we agree on. A story like this can remind us about the greatness of Georgian literature and help us to withstand Russian aggression. I hope so. And I remember this interview because it kind of took me aback at the very end he brings up completely unprompted by me. I, I didn't mention this at all. He says, oh yeah, and by the way, this is gonna be good against Russian aggression. <laughs> that may be talking about this stuff, giving Georgian young people a strong sense of patriotism will help us in our fight against the Russians. And that's pretty striking, right? It, it gives you a window into, in a sense, how, how much you know, on people's minds right, um, the, the, the ongoing threat of a Russian invasion, of Russian aggression of all sorts is, uh, is, 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 is there. It's just kind of part of the background. It's always something that, that kind of erupts every once in a while. Um, and this is normal, right, because uh, Georgia had a war, a very brief war, but a destructive one with Russia in 2008 over disputed territory right? The same uh, motivations uh, that, that Putin is using today. So um, yeah, in a way, it's comics, right? And comics are, you know, entertainment, and they are there uh, for literary kind of, you know, enjoyment, but they're also serious business. They're also part of a kind of psyops, a kind of culture war, uh, hate to use that term, but a way to kind of prepare people and to, in a sense, inoculate people against other kinds of propaganda or, or other kinds of threats. And specifically, right, not just threats from anywhere, threats from Russia, threats from the imperialist um, uh, Russian uh, regime led by Putin. Um, so pretty, pretty, pretty amazing <laughs> for me when, when that came up in that interview. It also puts me in mind, uh, as we turn our attention now to Ukraine, of works by generations of, of Ukrainian authors going back to the 19th century and beyond, who also are writing about their own nationhood as under threat, um, as, as, as precarious, right? And just to give you an example from the 90s, uh, Oksana Zabushko's uh, novel, Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex, where she says, and she kind of reiterates this in various ways throughout the novel, she says, Ukrainian choice is a choice between non-existence and an existence that kills you. A kind of state of always not really knowing whether you're going to be around, whether Ukraine will continue to exist as a country. Um, the Ukrainian national anthem even has this idea embedded in it. It begins, Ukraine has not yet vanished, <laughs> right? We're still here. Uh, we're not gone yet, right? But keep checking. So there is this way, right, where places like Ukraine and Georgia and Armenia and so many of these other places that were formerly under formal uh, Soviet uh, domination and that are still under in, the, in Russia's neighborhood, um, in a sense, have to be on their guard. And, and Russians, uh, I'm sorry, and comics are, are, are reflective of that as is literature, as is every artistic form. The other thing that I think is important is the ways that Russian, uh, I'm sorry, Ukrainian intellectuals and historians have also characterized this, um, this Russian threat. It is ubiquitous, it is always there, it is something that is always um, uh, is, is on the horizon. Uh, Sergei Plohi, a Ukrainian uh, 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 historian, writes, puts it this way. He says, for Ukraine, Russian aggression raises fundamental questions about its continuing existence as a unified state, its independence as a nation, the democratic formulate foundations of its political institutions. No less important are questions about the nature of Ukraine's nation-building project, including the role of history, ethnicity, language, culture in the forging of Ukraine's political uh, act nation. Uh, and so could a country whose citizens represented different ethnicities, spoke often interchangeably more than one language, belonged to more than one church, and inhabited a number of diverse historical regions, withstand not only the onslaught of a more militantly powerful imperial master, but also its claim to the loyalty of everyone who spoke Russian or worshipped at an Orthodox church. Um, that's, again, an acknowledgement of the diversity at the heart of Ukraine, the fact that you do have a large Russian-speaking population, a lot of it, but not all of it, in the, in the East, 
closer to Russia, and then a Ukrainian speaking population, a lot of it, but not all of it to the West and much more oriented towards, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Western European Union. And so that, in a sense, is what Russia is trying to take advantage of, that there are divisions within Ukrainian culture. And also the, uh, the, the false narrative that Ukraine was always part of Russia and that um, we're not really invading a country, we're just taking back what's already ours, which is uh, garbage. Right, and so that that is uh, at the heart of so many of these questions today. So, just to again, I, I assume people are are basically have a baseline awareness of what's been going on, but we're talking about a war that did not start in 2022, not at all. It started in 2014, but even that was just the modern version of something that's been an ongoing conflict for a very very long time. But we're talking about the uh, independence movement that starts in November of 2013, it really kind of blows up in 2014. And if you all remember the, uh, the Winter Olympics uh, that were held in Sochi back then, uh, practically at the time that those Winter Olympics are happening and Putin is there is when he's losing control of Ukraine. So it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a remarkable kind of coincidence that happened there. So the Euromaidan protests, eventually they oust a Ukrainian um, president who was very partial to Russia and they clearly make themselves, the, the, the Ukrainian people make it, make them, their politicians aware that they want to reorient towards the West. That ends up, of course, leading to all sorts of other uh, questions uh, pertaining to the, the seizure of Crimea by the Russians, the loss of it, and the, the opening up of Eastern, uh, of Eastern Ukraine to these separatist movements. And so that war really has been going on uh, at least since then. Um, comics, right? What is going on in comics? Um, you can very much see, uh, and I'm only just looking at works that are actually fairly recent in the last 10 years, but you can already see this strain of a, uh, a nationalist kind of patriotic representation of the nation uh, really coming uh, to the fore, using things that I think are pretty recognizable in terms of genre, in terms of even some of the look. All of these works are made on computer, right? They're using computer coloring and, and all of that good stuff. So there's something like The Will or Volia uh, that comes out by Bugayev um, around this time, 2012 where you have a, a kind of alternate reality where you have a republic uh, of, 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 of Ukraine, the Ukraine People's Republic, which was a real thing. It happened uh, around the time of the Soviet um, revolution in 1917. So it was actually, it actually was an independent republic for a while. It eventually gets incorporated, not, not entirely willingly into the Soviet Union. But what if that, that republic had never fallen? What if they had been able to stay independent forever? And so that, that's kind of the, the the the, uh, the premise of this series and uh, as you can see it has a real steampunky kind of uh, aesthetic and that's that's again um, it, it's using that that kind of uh, of look to appeal to and but actually to make a very very profound point about a relationship of, of Ukrainians after their history and to their desire for for something uh, autonomous independent of Russia whoops uh, let me see so the other thing that I explore in my um, in in some of my work on Ukraine is work by this artist, Igor Baranko, who is uh, pretty much the most well-known internationally uh, of the Ukrainian artists. He's had the most translations into English. He has one graphic novel that comes out uh, in its new form 2013, in 2013 called Jihad, and it is another alternate history. It, it's fascinating how often alternate histories uh, appear in Ukrainian work. I think, again, partly because they want to find alternatives. They find want to find ways to, to think more in, 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 in a larger way about the possibilities for their nation. Um, but it's also a novel that is extremely dystopian and that it is all about invasion. So in this page, as you can see here, he uses um, the fact that this region of the world has been invaded over and over and over by the Siths, by the Mongolians, right, uh, and, and by other peoples, and so, and, and the Huns. And so th this is, of course, had a, a, a a, a, a very big impact on the development of, of, of the culture and, and these civilizations. But just this cyclical nature of it, right? The way he uses this page uh, to kind of talk about how this is a, a very repetitive kind of phenomenon. Uh, there, there are different armies, different peoples, but you know, in a sense, they, 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 they're, they're kind of doing the same thing. It's, uh, it's this unending cycle. Um, other things that he talks about, right, are, are notions that would be very familiar for most Ukrainians of Russians who are trying to infiltrate the country, which is what these folks are doing in, in this page. And I, I picked this one because one of these, these Russian uh, kind of spies that are trying to infiltrate Ukraine, they're listening to Ukrainian radio on the, uh, on the train as they're going in there. And one of them says very explicitly, oh, I hate Ukrainian. It sounds like a parody of Russian. 
why do we still put up with their independence, right? Uh, which is a very common notion. I heard it many times when I was living in Russia, uh, the idea that Ukrainian, um, the Ukrainian language is not really a language. It's like a dialect of Russian. It's Russian spoken badly. People would say, people who were educated would say this to me, like thinking it wasn't a problem, um, but it's, it's the worst kind of chauvinism. Um, Ukrainian is its own language. The Ukrainian people have their own culture. They have their own country. Um, and for some reason, you know, there, there's, there's this uh, enduring kind of prejudice uh, that has led directly to, to where we are today. So, you know, the, the novel is reflecting um, all of this. And then we come, like I said, to the latest episode, which begins in uh, February 24th. And I, I, I'm not going to cover this, but I mean, it's, it's this kind of imagery, right? Um, the ways that a lot of us uh, who have been looking at this region for a long time, this is our, you know, th th this, this is the worst case scenario, obviously obviously for, for, the, uh, for the Ukrainians first and foremost, but this is the thing that all of us were, were dreading, that a lot of us were seeing, and um, this is what has happened. So, you know, you see the various Russian incursions all over. This is from early in the war, right? When they were actually trying to take over the capital of Kiev. Um, they were really seriously trying to basically take over this entire country, uh, largest in Europe. Right, and you have images like this, which are sadly um, evocative of uh, of World War II. Right, to me, when I look at this, when I see people fleeing with their belongings, trying to get out, um, packed train stations, everybody desperate. Um, it is. It is. I, I've often told my students, if you ever wanted to wonder what it was like to live in the 1930s. Uh, when Hitler's armies were marching through Europe and, you know, during the war itself, when there were refugee flows all over the continent, this is, this is, you know, this is close. This is kind of what it was like, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's one of those sad facts of, of life that history kind of tends to repeat. So here we are, um, as well as obviously the, the, the horrible thing are the, um, the attacks on civilians, right? Which continue to this day. There are, there are missiles that were launched to Kiev today, right? Right now, hitting civilian targets. Um, it's 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 a war against the Russian people. Don't don't let them fool you. This is not a military conflict. It's it's national terrorism. It's violence against unarmed populations. To th they're even sorry, they're even bombing maternity hospitals. Right. This is one of the famous pictures. That's a pregnant woman who was trying to give birth to her baby. This woman later died along with her unborn child. Right. Um, why would you bomb a hospital that's meant for mothers, <laughs> um, unless you're trying to wipe out? Uh, these people, you're trying to dishearten them to such an extent that they will give up. That's the cynicism of the Russian uh, policy in this war. Even something like this, right? The the way that this war has given us new terms for atrocities, like Bucha, right? I, all, all I have to do is say the word Bucha now and people understand what we mean. It's like saying Auschwitz. It's like saying Milai, right? Like we understand now that this means an attack on civilians. And right, this picture that's been circulating, perhaps one of the most famous pictures from this war of this woman with her nails done, right here, her dead body, who was later identified um, as a citizen of Bucha, uh, Irina Filkina, who was an aspiring cosmetician. What, what, what I really think is important is that we not turn these deaths and these people into statistics, into just kind of anonymous people. I, 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 I want you to look at her. I want you to look that that was a person. That was a person who, wanted something out of life and she was killed she was gunned down right um and there's her body that was left there to rot so um that's not what we want that's not what anybody wants but that's what's going on two things like this uh june 27th uh there was a um, a bombing of a mall a shopping mall that was hit by a missile killed dozens of people why do you bomb a mall like, what's the point of that? that? That's not a military installation. That's not a cruiser ship or anything. That's people going shopping. So um, this, is, this is why I think, as you can probably perceive, um, that I'm extremely angry about this. I have a lot of emotions and unresolved feelings about Russia, where I have many friends. Um, but I, 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 I really kind of am struggling with this myself every time something like this kind of is happening. This is more or less where we are right now. So the, the news has sort of been good lately, right? This is actually, this map is a little bit out of date because we know that they've already taken care of But, you know, the, the war is not really anywhere near finished, not in any kind of military sense. Um, and, and we're going to see the winter is upon us and there's going to be a lot more suffering. So all of that is, is informing then how people like me, like I said, are reconsidering and rethinking what uh, we can do to talk about Russia and Russian culture and Russian literature 
in new ways, ways that are not abetting or you know, acting in complicity with, enabling any kind of Russian imperialist mentality, which is kind of what got us here in the first place. And people like me, I think, are, are, are really rethinking, like, like maybe I haven't been critical enough uh, about Russian culture. So it's changing everything that I'm doing in my teaching. I returned to one of the, um, uh, the great voices in post-colonial theory, Edward Said, who I think has been a, an important guiding voice here. And this is what he is saying about maybe part of what this task would entail. He says, neither imperialism nor colonialism is a simple act of accumulation and acquisition. Both are supported and perhaps even impelled by impressive ideological formations that include notions that certain territories and people require and beseech domination as well as forms of knowledge affiliated with domination. The vocabulary of classic 19th century imperial culture is plentiful with words and concepts like inferior or subject races or subordinate peoples, dependency, expansion, authority. Out of the imperial experiences, notions about culture were clarified and reinforced, um, criticized or rejected, right? So novels, paintings, ballets, right? Any kind of art form is, is, is going to be part of either, you know, a policy, um, a kind of war footing, or it's going to resist it, right? And there is no kind of neutrality in here. So right, we have to rethink everything. There are ballet companies all over this country right now that are putting on the Nutcracker. That's a Russian ballet, right? It's part of Christmas uh, traditions. Um, should we maybe re rethink it? I'm not saying that it's Tchaikovsky's fault that Ukraine is, is under assault, um, but is there something about the Nutcracker and, and, and what, is, what is there that should make us maybe rethink some of what it is that, that is being um, promoted in that, in that, in that, um, in that work? Um, so that, that's what Saeed, I think, wants us to really think about. The other thing he wants us to, to really do is to go back and do two things. He wants us to look at the works of the colonizers, so Russians, right, Russian uh, artists like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, the big names, is there something embedded in their own outlook that has also, in a sense, been um, giving a free pass to this Russian uh, imperialist mentality? And then number two, of course, we got to go look at the resistors, the people, the voices who were working against that, both within Russian culture and maybe even more importantly, people in, in Ukraine, right, of, of which we know there's been a long standing tradition. So, but you need to do both to get understanding and to really be effective in rethinking how to, uh, to ethically teach uh, Russian culture in this case. That's, so that's kind of in a sense what I'm struggling here. I, I don't have all the answers myself right now, but this project is an attempt to kind of do that. Okay, I'm gonna go on uh, because I wanna now talk about Ukrainian voices much more specifically. Going back to Zabushko, who is the same author as um, uh, the, the author that I pointed out before, uh, Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex. This is also something that really struck me. It's very much in this line that Saeed is, uh, is promoting. She says, prior to February 24th, the beginning of the war, I had only ever met one European Slavist who in 2014, a deep, deeply disturbed by the Orwellian turn in Moscow, asked forgiveness from Ukrainians for having spent his life looking at Kyiv through Russian spectacles as the third city of the Russian empire and for not properly seeing the capital of a thousand euro local culture, a culture towards which the Russian empire has behaved much as the Russian army has behaved in Bucha. What it could steal, it stole. What it couldn't, it destroyed. Such realizations may now become more common because the road for bombs and tanks has always been paved by books. And we are now firsthand witnesses to how the fate of millions can be decided by our reading choices. It is time to take a long, hard look at our bookshelves. And let me tell you, when this article came out, um, it, it, it really led to some uh, divisions and controversy and people say, oh my God, like I have to look at my bookshelf or I, you know, leave my Dostoevsky alone. Um, like, do we really need to kind of reimagine all of this? Can we really say that it's Pushkin's fault, right? Pushkin, the national poet of, of Russia. He's kind of like their Shakespeare. Um, could, could it have been his uh, you know, complicity on some level? Um, but that's exactly what Zabushko is saying. She's even saying we should throw out the Russian books, right? That why are we kind of reading the literature of aggressors of a nation that has given up its right, right to any kind of, you know, entry into civilized society? That's, that, that's a pretty extreme, right? Hard position. And, and I think we can talk about it. Um, but I think it, it, it is, this is the time for hard questions, in my opinion. So I agree with Zabushko about that. Um, it's not a time to go easy. 
here, right? Because we're, we're, we're dealing with life and death after all. And then uh, right around this time, uh, you have uh, this quote that was circulating by Mikhail Piotrovsky, who is the director of the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, the absolute pinnacle of Russian high culture. This is one of the great museums in the world. It's five times bigger than the Louvre in Paris, right? So this is in St. Petersburg, an absolute treasure chest of the greatest masterpieces of the world. This is the man in charge of it. And look at what he says. He's a big buddy with Putin, very supportive of the war. He says, our recent exhibitions abroad are just a powerful cultural offensive. If you want a kind of special operation, spitzoperatia, which is the term that, that is the official term for the, the, what's going on in Ukraine, you can't call it a war in Russia or you'll be arrested. You'll be, so people have gone to prison, right? It's not, it's not officially a war. It's a special operation. If you want a kind of special operation, which a lot of people don't like, but we are coming and no one can be allowed to interfere with our offensive. So that look at that language. Right, he's basically saying that our culture is a kind of weapon that we can use. That our exhibits abroad, right, are going to bring people more to our side because they'll see the greatness of uh, of Russian culture, and therefore, you know, they won't resist us. That's that's really. Uh, th I mean, if you're going to talk about right what, what Zabushko means, I mean, this is it. This is, and this is coming not just from anybody. This is you know pretty much the leading cultural figure. In some respects, Piotrowski is more important than the culture minister. Uh, in who's, of course, part of the government. So it's, uh, you know, that's what we're talking about, really, uh, it seems to me. And I, I don't need to make this up. I've got, I've got people like this talking in just this way all the time. All right, so uh, where am I? I want to talk then how, uh, now about how uh, uh, Ukrainian comics artists themselves then have been approaching the conflict both recently, right, with the start of this latest phase of the war, but also, like I said, earlier uh, in this century when, when, you know, the, the, when the war in eastern Ukraine was already raging, uh, going back to, to 2014, right? Um, something like Serhii Zaharov's 2016 graphic novel, The Whole, which is, I think, gives you an example of one of the great advantages of comic art over other media. The way that you can use it to document things that are otherwise inaccessible inaccessible to film, inaccessible to photography, inaccessible to other things, and, and how you're able, in a sense, to give a visual record of something, right? So basically, Saharov writes about the imprisonment and torture uh, of, of people in this, in the Donetsk People's Republic, one of the separatist, separatist republics here in, in Eastern Ukraine. And he talks about what it is like to kind of be under uh, these people's, um, you know, kind of uh, domination. Uh, other things like this that have come up uh, online are, I think, another very compelling example of what you can do with comics, the immediacy of comics and the ways that you can crank them out quickly. Uh, you can do war diaries like this. So this is by Anna Ivanenko and Yene Polosina, uh, where she, and this was published in English and hyper allergic, uh, but there's a lot of people who have put stuff online. Basically, folks who go to the shelters, go to the subway stations while their cities are being bombed. They, they, they make these comics. Uh, a lot of them are in English because they're interested in getting international audiences. And so they will put them out. And so you can follow these things, right? You can read these uh, uh, anywhere you have an internet connection. We are safe, the bomb shelter is fine. And so you can talk about your own experiences and also just show people, right? What it, what it kind of looks like. Um, comics are a medium of word and image and often the, uh, the tensions that emerge between the two and, uh, and I think this is what is, uh, I think, so, so valuable about them. Um, it gives you more context than just a photograph, uh, but it also gives you a sense of, of some, some of the advantages of, of, a, of a kind of literary and, and, and a visual mode together. Now I want to talk about material here that is getting, uh, I, I, um, I would argue, maybe more politicized and more uh, even anti-Russian specifically, because a lot of these war diaries are really just people telling you about how they're, they're surviving. Uh, but here we're actually getting into something more pointed. And so this was Genia Olenik's Key of His Spine, where she will use things like irony, sarcasm, humor to kind of talk about her own kind of experiences, right? Where she says, oh, we're fine. And then we have an explosion. So it's, it's kind of a black humor. Obviously, we're talking about people getting killed in these cities, but, but she's also kind of willing to... Uh, to, to, to talk about some of the, uh, uh, the more <laughs> humorous aspects of this, of this experience. This was published in the NIB. And so, you know, we, we have these Western sources like the NIB, which is a major online comics journal um, and other things like hyperallergic that are, that are getting in on this, 
Um, also in Europe, there's a case, I, I don't have a slide for it, but there's a, um, an Italian artist named Igor, who has also uh, been doing a lot of this in real time. He was putting on Facebook some of his own comics uh, that were based on conversations he was having on the phone with his friends in Ukraine. He spent time in Ukraine, and now he has a new book of those, of those works and that, but, but I don't have that available to show you guys. Okay. Um, someone like Zoya Cherkasky Nadi is another very example, a, a very fascinating and, and really hard hitting example. These are some of the most violent ones. Um, she is someone who grew up in Ukraine, but she's actually lived in Israel for several years. But of course, she has a lot of memories and she goes back to Ukraine. And so what she has often done is shown you some of these places where she grew up, like that bread line, right? That, that, that word there is, means bread. So people are lining up for bread. And that, that's a very typical kind of memory of growing up in the late Soviet period, lining up for consumer goods like bread. But then what she does is take that same subject and return to it now since 2022, but now she's shown that that bread line has been bombed, right? So there, it's, it's a really kind of stark kind of reminder of how things are. It's the same Ukraine, it's the same people in many cases, but it's those people that are bidding, getting killed. Um, she has these, she has a whole series of these. So these are, again, these are, these are things that she made earlier, like in some cases, 20 years ago, she returns to the same subjects and now kind of redoes them in a kind of a war footing, uh, which again is really, really hard hitting and striking. Um, this is one of the more violent ones that she does. She shows a little park. Um, it's pretty clear that the people have not only been shot, but uh, the women show evidence of, of sexual uh, assault and all sorts of things. So it's, it's really, really um, disturbing uh, material. And she wants you to see it. She wants, again, this is the kind of thing that um, comics can do through the language of caricature and cartoon that might actually make this more accessible for people than say a photograph of this kind of atrocity, which is hard for, for many people to take, uh, understandably. But, but above all, you know, artists like this really want you to see it. They don't want you to think of the war in Ukraine as whatever, a headline, something that comes up on a Twitter feed. They want you to see what the hell is going on. And, and, and they wanna use every, every component and, and a tool of comics to do that. Uh, even the, uh, the Ukrainian government has gotten in on some of this, right? By even printing some of their, some of this stuff on their, um, on their postage stamps. So, you know, you probably guys probably know about that famous incident in the uh, uh, Snake Island where the Russian, the, sorry, the Ukrainian troops tell the Russian cruiser to go fuck itself. Uh, what's, what's kind of funny and also kind of dark is that since then, that cruiser was actually sunk, as you guys know, the Moskva. And so they released a new series where the cruiser is dark. So there is this kind of, again, black humor sort of there that is pretty amazing when you see it in a postage stamp. You could actually use that in, in, to mail something. So it's, uh, you know, again, I think anything that'll keep people's spirits up, this is obviously one of the, the, the more good, good, good news parts of it. I mean, I'm sorry that people died, obviously, but it's, it's, it's war and it's, they're defending themselves. Uh, one of the most hard hitting of the artists that I look at is Maxim Palenko. And, and by hard hitting, I, I'm, I'm saying that he is attacking uh, very, very much the heart of the uh, of, of Russian culture and making very explicit claims, as Abushka was earlier, that actually uh, Russian culture owns a lot of this war. They have a lot of the responsibility. There is something at the heart of Russian culture, Polenko wants us to understand, that has led step by step by step to where we are now. And so this is I think a pretty amazing uh, picture myself. Does anybody recognize? Well, I guess I give it to you there on the on the on the caption. Um, that's Alexander Pushkin. That is the national poet of Russia. He is sort of like their uh, Shakespeare and Byron uh, and Keats kind of all together. One of the greatest poets who ever lived. Um, and uh, of course, he has nothing directly to do with the war. He died in 1837, but right, he has put his face, his bust, on top of a Russian missile. Uh, a pretty striking uh, kind of image here that's basically saying, yeah, Pushkin is part of the war effort. Pushkin is um, to some extent responsible for making it okay to make fun of Ukraine as he did in some of his poetry, making it okay to think of Russian literature as a superior kind of form of expression over other peoples of the empire as he did in some of his poetry. So it's, it's not an innocent uh, figure for him. Same thing here, he take, this is, again, it's, it's hilarious, but it's also really disturbing. He has various Russian soldiers, you can tell because they're wearing Russian uniforms or, or mercenary uniforms. Um, but then he has 
cultural figures, right? Uh, Dostoevsky, he's got Gogol, he's got Lermontov, he's got Mayakovsky, Yesenin, Tolstoy, and even Joseph Brodsky, who again was one of the people that was really called out. Joseph Brodsky was a dissident poet. He eventually becomes poet laureate of the US when he immigrates. Uh, uh, basically a kind of humanist ideal. Everybody loves uh, Brodsky because that yeah, they think of him as someone who is maybe not part of that imperialist Russian culture at all, except that he has a poem that's been circulating recently that was very anti-Ukraine, right? Uh, that's basically saying that you, you Ukrainians that are leaving us at the beginning of the, the post-Soviet period, you're becoming your own country, but you'll come crawling back to us because we have better, you know, the better poet is Pushkin. And, and he uses a word like shit. He's calls Ukrainian poetry a kind of shit. Um, so that's, again, the kind of reappraisal that I think we need to make. He's putting them, you know, right there. So, you know, you, the immediacy of this stuff, it's pretty clear. These are kind of like mugshots of, of Russian cultural figures um, that are, you know, war criminals. That's pretty, that's pretty strong. Same thing here, same, same, same thing from, from Alexei Say, basically, taking the Russian two-headed eagle and the ballet, which are all signatures of Russian culture, and putting two important writers, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, at the top, and then, of course, showing a devastated uh, part of Kiev. Now I want to finish up with my, with my, uh, my main example, and in a way, the most painful and, and most complex example. And this is... Uh, uh, the work of Victoria Lobosco and how it's been received in Ukraine uh, by some people. So in order to, to know what I'm going to be talking about, you need to have some awareness of this uh, monument from the Soviet era, which is a monument to the uh, Battle of Stalingrad, which is a huge war in World War II, which Russia won against the Nazis, of course. And so uh, it is in Volgograd, Russia. So it's a big symbol of, you know, defending the motherland, all that good stuff. Um, this is Victoria Lamasco, who is a Russian comics artist that I've written a lot about in both of my books. Um, but here she is taking that monument and showing uh, in this work how the war in Ukraine is actually going to be a self-inflicted wound, a wound that is in a way going to bring down uh, Russian culture, Russian society, the Russian government, right? As she puts it, it incorporates the figure suicide of post-Soviet reality. And so, you know, nobody could mistake this image as being pro-war, pro-Putin, or pro-Russia, right? It is very much about uh, speaking out against it and kind of maybe mocking it to a certain degree. And that's certainly the way I think that Victoria Lamasco intends it. Um, that said, however, the way that the work was received in Russia, I'm sorry, in Ukraine, was uh, not exactly what, what she had um, what she had anticipated, it seems to me. A lot of this stuff unfolded on Facebook. Some of it was in English, some of it was in Russian. And so it was kind of fascinating to follow this and to see how people were commenting. And so what, what, part of what I'm doing here is, is, is following that discussion. I need to move here so I can read this, sorry. So she says, uh, and so this is a work by Aleftina Kakidze, who is a Ukrainian cartoonist, who was basically calling out La Moscow and, and basically daring her to, uh, to account for why we should pay attention to anything that Russian artists are saying right now, even those who are against Putin, right? Because like, what, what have you been doing to stop you know, this war from ever happening? She says, Victoria, another fail. You already deleted one uh, post from the beginning of the war. Are you going for another? The biggest problem with artists from Russia isn't whether or not they will be canceled by the international community or whether or not they'll be left out of Russia. It's that you and many other Russian artists make bad art. Like those drawings, for example, it's not suicide. It's the destruction of your post-Soviet agony. Only you didn't draw those who are blowing off the head of your Soviet past because your imperial mindset doesn't allow your talented hands to draw us. Ukraine, me, my husband in the territorial defense, the people who have stayed behind in my village, the volunteers in the armed forces of Ukraine. We're not in your picture, like Putin says, right? So that's a pretty hard um, response to, again, what most people in the international community saw as a, a kind of dissident anti-war message. Uh, Kakitsa, who of course is, is from Ukraine, right, is uh, not really buying it um, at all. Um, she's saying that any attention you are giving to any Russian artist is taking attention away from where it should be placed, which is with, your, with Ukrainian artists, right? That's again, a pretty, a pretty hard line that, that she's drawing and we can, we can debate it. But again, the, the, the moral question here, I think, is, is, is important to, uh, to consider. Let me also say that uh, La Mosco, I, I've never actually interacted with Aleptina Kakitsa, but I have for many years known Victoria La Mosco. So it is 
um, you know, something that is, is uh, very personal for me as well to kind of get into these things. She responds, Lamasco writes back on Facebook to Kakitsa. She says, I cannot argue with you now because of Russian investigation in your country, the tragedy, the murders of people by the Russian army, I must get all things that you tell me to my side and keep silence. But when the war is finished, I am ready to an open discussion with you in any public space. Only I will have to do it with a translator because my English isn't good. I can answer only very approximately in English. So you, you can see you know, the, the difficulty of Lamasco's position here, right? I mean, she's, she doesn't want to back down from what she's done. She's an artist, right? And she stands by her art. At the same time, she recognizes that, uh, that she is taking some oxygen away from Ukrainian artists. And, and uh, you know, so she's basically trying to say, look, let's just put a pin in this. And let's deal with it after the war. Um, as you can imagine, this was not satisfactory to uh, Kakitsa or to many other people in Ukraine. Um, so it, 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 the arguments continue, but this is kind of in, in, in a nutshell, I think, uh, succinctly what Kakitsa's position is. And again, in a Facebook post from May, she says, I don't believe in Vika's murals in which the head of the Soviet past, which in part is carrying out this war, just magically falls off or kills itself. It looks to me like it's we Ukrainians who have put a stop to that which the anti-Putin people like Vika couldn't stop no matter how much they wanted to and how hard they tried. I need, the Ukrainian people need, a conversation about Vika's works right now while the war is going on, right? Don't, don't put us off till the end of the war. Like, let's talk right now. They are problematic. They create problems. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating and intriguing and, and very, very difficult, I think, conversation here, but the lines are, are pretty hardly drawn. This, this is, in a sense, the kind of literary front of the war, right? One way or the other. And, and again, we can decide whether this is motivated or not, but it's coming out of this need, right, that, that Kakids is saying, to bring all Russian artists and all Russian culture to account, not let them off easy. Even the people who supposedly are, you know, on our side. The other question, and this resonates with me, right? When she says like, you know, how come you guys couldn't stop Putin? We're actually doing a lot against Putin, right? But it's Ukrainians who are putting their lives on the line, defending their territory. How come we're having to fight this war, Russians? How come you didn't stop Putin yourselves? What have you done to drive Putin out of power? How did you vote? How did you try to, you know, protest against him? I don't care if you go to prison. Going to prison isn't as bad as having your family killed, right? That, that, that's kind of the the the... the the argument that the arguments that that she is making, it's it's hard to um, hard to answer, frankly, and I think that that's the difficult position Lamasco has been put in. All of this then comes into a head, not in the world of Facebook with posts and all these things going on, but in the world of comics itself. So, what happens in April of 2022? And this was actually part of maybe what set off this whole thing. That in the mural that they're talking about, there is this thing published in the New Yorker, Collective Shame, that is illustrated by Joe Sacco. Joe Sacco, some of you probably know, is a major American comics artist. He's a friend of uh, of Victoria's and and a friend of me actually. And uh, so he they work together, and it's basically a four page comic published the New Yorker that deals with um, Victoria Lamasco's struggles leaving Russia. You know, she, she's now living in Europe. And, and basically, she, uh, she says that she wasn't really able to make comics about it because she, she basically left with just a couple of bags, didn't have her art tools. So then Joe comes up and Joe Sacco decides to illustrate it for her. So it's kind of a collaboration. So that's basically what it is. It's an autobiography comic about leaving Russia and going off as a ref as she not technically a refugee because she wasn't she could go back, but you know she might have used the word refugee. Kakitsa is pretty pissed off about this comic. She's pissed off that this is what Americans are reading in the New Yorker. She sees it as something that is full of lies. And what she does is that she takes the actual pages, just to, again, what you can see here, the original, the first page of the work, and she basically deconstructs it. She, she imposes her own annotation. She breaks up the page and she basically is correcting a lot of what she sees as the problem. So she says, um, hello, Joe, to add, uh, my name is Aleptina and I'm a member uh, of, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and she goes on and talks about uh, various things like, I I'm here to add what Victoria Lamasco left out since she couldn't find any supplies in a peaceful country and you decided to be Victoria Lamasco's pen. You didn't produce collective shame, you produced collective violence. So first of all, she doesn't buy this idea that Lamasco didn't have 
uh, art supplies. You can't find art supplies in Germany. <laughs> there, there must, right. So she doesn't buy any of that. And so in other words, she's saying La Mosca is kind of posing for pity. Oh, I had to leave my country. Oh, you know, I've been persecuted by Putin. You know, you know here's my story. Uh, Alevtina is uh, pretty angry that that's the pose that La Mosca is using. So she's calling her out. What's fascinating about this piece is how it basically is ripping apart that earlier comic and imposing this other vision. Here it is. This is what uh, people like Zabushko, people like, uh, like Kakidze and others are saying you kind of have to do. Don't just accept what's coming out of Russia, what's coming out of these voices. You have to kind of grapple with it and if necessary, rip it apart. This is in a sense, the comics version of a kind of warfare, really. I don't think that's too strong of a word. Um, <laughs> just read you a couple of things. Uh, Victoria can use her Russian sayings, but only in Russia. Victoria could not open an account in Belgium, not because she is Russian. She needs to follow all the same rules as other Russian foreign, as, as other foreigners, right? So in the in her comic, La Moscow is talking about, you know, it was hard for her to open a, an account, partly because of the sanctions, blah, blah, blah. Again, Olive uh, Kakitz is saying, yeah, that that's you just have to follow the rules, right? You're just a foreigner. So it it is kind of a fascinating, fascinating document um, that's happening on the page itself. This is the way that um, uh, another uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, commentator has has uh, uh, discussed this work. She says, Aleptina Kakitz's critical intervention with the alternative title Collective Blindness, which not only breaks up the original page architecture of the comic through a radical montage technique, but also implements an alternative narrative in text and image, works on several levels. The comic caricature supplements it at the same time, decenters the narrative with the Ukrainian perspective, raises questions about the role of art and resistance in Russia and confronts the authors of the comic with the reality of war in Ukraine in a version that is now available in three languages. The black and white original version is now staged in bright yet red and rich yellow, right? Just as a visual document, right? It's very important for Kakitsa to impose her stamp. So where the original comic is in black and white, she, she brings in these yellow markers and other red kind of markings. Pretty important, important stuff. Um, and again, right, it is, a direct response on the page to um, what she perceives as a kind of Russian aggression. That is kind of where I am with this project, which I, I, am, I am working on. And um, it is, again, a reminder of how Ukrainian artists have to be centered one way or the other, right? Uh, because it is a war and the stakes could not be higher. I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, why don't we go ahead and take questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, who would win? Superman or the Hulk? <sighs> I'll take that. And then also, if anybody who's on Zoom wants to put a question in the chat, I can go ahead and also follow that. Does anybody have any questions? If we can have the um, video slides available, we can just put them right above. Yeah, we can just toggle over to yeah. them as, as needed. Okay. Does that okay. work? Then I can see the chat. That's fine. Any questions? Please. Uh, I was going to ask, like, where do you personally draw the line between, like, allyship and being, like, supportive in the cause that you can put both of these items? I'm not sure I understand. Like over, you mean like because I'm an American, I'm going to get automatically more attention than a Ukrainian? No, 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 no. I don't mean that. I mean that from the uh, Ukrainian perspective. Right now, like we talked about Afghanistan, it's really huge talk, like how uh, Moscow is like kind of like this like Russian centered herself rather than the situation. Right. Well. There, there, you know, first of all, um, Ukraine is its own country uh, and it has its own destiny. That said, there was a lot of interactions and a lot of intermarriages and, and a lot of Russia. There was a lot of travel between Russia and, and Ukraine. And then, you know, so that's um, that part of it is true, right? That doesn't mean that, however, that Russia somehow owns Ukraine the way that Putin would have his belief. So what I'm trying to say is that there were many Russians actually who did go to Ukraine to help you know, to be with their families or just to, to, to serve in the, uh, the uh, 
if not the war effort, but best definitely in trying to help. So in other words, you can do that. And, and so one of the things that they call out La Mosco for not doing is like, well, what are you doing getting grants and you know funding in Germany as an artist? She just had a big exhibit open up in Italy just in the last few days. Um, and so the question becomes like, why are you there? <laughs> why aren't you, if, if you really wanna help Ukrainians, go to Ukraine. There's volunteers that you could, you know, that uh, or organizations where you could be helping out. Whatever, put your body on the ground, you know, if you're really serious. So you're asking me like, how do you kind of like try to help but not overshadow? I think that's the critique of La Mosco is that she's, um, that she's still thinking about her own career first <laughs> before uh, Ukraine, and then she also wants to use the fact that she cares about Ukraine. I think she cares about Ukraine, <laughs> but she, um, but she's kind of using that maybe to 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 get, you know. Uh, pity points uh, for her. Um, the other thing that's also kind of weird about this whole situation, and I, I, I mean to actually interview the different parties, but if you just read Facebook, you would think that Aleftina and La Mosco have never met, that they're just kind of talking over the internet. And you would also think that La Mosco, or I'm sorry, that, 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 that they, because she says at one point, well, I'm sorry, I, I don't speak very good English. We need a translator to talk about all these things. The weird thing, though, is that Aleftina and La Mosco have worked together at a festival uh, in the 2000s, uh, to, to 2010s in, in, in St. Petersburg, and, and they both speak Russian. Aleftina speaks Russian. So it's kind of a strange thing for Victoria. And this is the first thing I would probably ask her is like, why are you talking about needing a translator when you guys both speak Russian and you speak the language? So it's not a language barrier question, which to me casts some doubt on, on La Mosco's motive. So, that, that seems to be maybe the, the, the real problem is like, how do you be a good ally to, to, to put it in the way you phrased it um, without kind of making it all about yourself, <laughs> which is the real you know, attack on, on La Mosca. I, I leave it up to you to judge. I mean, <laughs> yeah. What did, what did, uh, Hi, Bill. Hi, what did He's another one I need to interview. No, really, this I'm really, because Sako is like right in the middle of all of this, right? I mean, like Sako has been friends with La Mosca for a long time. When uh, I was talking with, with Dr. Shipman Masters, uh, Lamosco did a tour of the of the West Coast when she was here in 2017, and we all went to dinner. I was it was Sako and Lamosco and me and, and a lot of other people, and so you know we're all buddy buddy. And so I I haven't asked him yet, but he's 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 got to be in an awkward position, because from his position he was just trying to help a friend who was in a bad bind, you know, who had been basically had to felt she had to leave her. She again she didn't have to leave Russia. She she did that by choice. So. It's wrong to call her a refugee. And she's been accused by some people of, of trying to use that term refugee for herself when she really isn't. She's not an exile. She could go back anytime. So, uh, but Sako has not inserted himself that I have seen into these online uh, issues. Some of these online stuff was happening in Russian, however. So I, I don't know to what degree he was really aware, but it's gotta be awkward, right? Yeah. You're clearly centering Ukrainian Arthur, which makes sense. Um, is there a Russian comics going right now? Uh, are you seeing from, from Russia itself? Are you seeing Russian comics in the three address the war or they 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 can't. I mean, not if they want to survive. Um they they're gonna get in trouble. There are laws in the books in Russia that if you speak out against the war, you're gonna be fined, or in the worst cases, you're gonna be sent to, to, to jail. So legally you know, they, they, they can't do it. And then if, if you try to do it, you know, your funding might get cut off. And, and in the worst case, you might have thugs come and, and beat you up. I mean, they're, so it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I bet I, I'm, there, there are of course people who are against the war, but you have to be very, very careful about how you, I mean, the ones who really, really want to speak out against it have done what La Mosca has done, they've left and then they can do whatever, but then they're at the mercy of, you know, whatever they can dig up in terms of a living, yeah. I did, just continuing that point, I did find, Please. Uh, I did find it interesting that uh, they say, like, you can't speak out against the war in Russia uh, in a lot of things like that. Uh, I guess it was like, you can't speak out against the war in Russia, so like, because, uh, oh, the one Ukrainian person who talked about why didn't you vote, why didn't you, you know. Oliptina, yeah. And then they really can't, because like, the whole, 
I know from my buddy, like the whole meme about like, oh, this dictator won with like 125 percent of the votes, and like it's kind of already happened over there. If we can see, uh, what is the uh, uh, well, the first thing we're looking at that is Navalny. What happened with Navalny? Well, he's imprisoned. Yeah, exactly. They can't really do much in there. So that is seems like a very tough position to then leave and try and say something is now the world is still world. So it's I can see it's a really I think a tough spot to be in. Like yeah. You can see you're like like you can't do much because you try to speak out every moment against the evil, but then if you stay, you're probably gonna get arrested. Well, or you just might get harassed. I mean, but you know, I I, I kind of don't buy that. I, I really don't care, frankly. If you're a Russian and you're against this war. You should be out on the damn streets, and and if you go to prison for ten years, then that that again, that's not as bad as having your your family bombed, and killed. I really I, I I'm again th this is part of the anger, and just kind of these these very mixed emotions that I have right now as someone who's been in the Russia business for twenty five years, um, someone who lived in Russia, has friends there, um, but I'm kind of angry. I'm kind of angry that it came to this point. Um, I'm angry that that this is that this has happened right. Um, I mean, I was also angry at us for letting things, you know, like Afghanistan happen and other things. I mean, so we have plenty of blood on our hands, obviously, as a country too. Uh, Vietnam, maybe a, another good example. But, um, but I, I, yeah, I, I just don't buy it anymore. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I know that there's not going to be a peaceful solution. There's never been a peaceful transfers of power in Russia. They've always been bloodbaths. Um, the, the really scary thing is that Russia has nukes. Uh, so, you know, that's probably gonna affect more than just Russia. So it, it's, it's a very, very precarious moment in all sorts of ways. But, but the idea that this was inevitable is kind of a cop-out, that the poor Russians couldn't do anything to stop this, um, you know? And I mean, I think something like Pussy Riot, maybe it's probably a, a group that you pause, that there has been an alternative in Russia, but it's just been very, very fractured. It's been very, very, you know, uh, impotent in many ways, but but those people still try. Most people were not. Pussy Riot is very unpopular in Russia. A lot of people still support Putin, right? Even now. So it's it's yeah. I'm I'm not satisfied that the that the Russians were kind of helpless here. Some of them want this war. You ask me what kind of cartoons are coming out. A lot of the cartoons that do come out are pro war, and a lot of them are are despicable. You know, they're happy that Kiev is being bombed. Because that's gonna that that means that Kiev is gonna return to Russia soon. That's bullshit. You know, I, I don't buy that. That's terrible. Others? Yeah. I'm not talking about banning, no, I'm not banning anything. I'm saying that we need to critically examine. Russian literature from the ground up, because a lot of us in, in our business, you know, we're in the Russia business. I've been teaching Russian literature my whole career, Russian cinema, um, and um, I love Russia, uh, and I love everything about Russian culture, but then there's always been this side to it. I recognize it, and so a lot of us in my field are just asking ourselves, we're, 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 could we have been a little bit harder? Could we, like when, when my, my Russian friends would make fun of Ukrainian accents, like maybe I should have spoken up more, right? Maybe I should have said something like that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one story. This happened around 10 years ago with, um, with Baranko, who is the, uh, the, the graphic novelist that I mentioned, who's the most famous one, who's been translated the most. This was happening in Moscow and it was a, it was a mixed group. It was Ukrainians, it was Russians, and it was me, the one American. And, and you know, whatever, we're drinking vodka and just kind of hanging around. And, and um, you need to know a little bit of grammar here. So there's, there's two ways that you can say in Ukraine, in Russian, you can say na Ukraina or va Ukraina. And this has actually become a, a point of contention. Those of you who speak uh, the language will know that um, to say na Ukraina, which is basically, a, a, which is emphasizing the idea of Ukraine being on the kind of periphery, right? That, that, that use of that term. And that was the traditional term. That's the way I learned to say it, by the way. I, I learned Russian back in the 80s, and that was the way. So everybody would say na Ukraina, which is, again, a kind of way of emphasizing that it's a part of something bigger, literally like the edge of something bigger. That's not the way you're supposed to say it if you're Ukrainian. If you're Ukrainian, you say vo Ukraina, which is basically saying in Ukraine, which is kind of 
talking about Ukraine. Just, just through the grammar, it emphasizes this is its own thing. It's its own separate entity. Russians to this day, a lot of them, and there's the way it's written about, it's the way they'll talk about it in the news, they'll say now Ukraine, which is supposed to be, you know, politically incorrect. Um, and certainly if you're for the war, you would say now Ukraine, because you don't really think of Ukraine as separate. You just think of Ukraine as a rebellious Russian province that needs to be, you know, tamed. Um, so anyway, we're all sitting around, we're drinking vodka. And so <laughs> at one point, somebody says, what are the Russians just we're talking about mentions? Oh, yeah, blah, 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 now Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. And it's like the whole party stops because the Ukrainian guy, Baranko, says, what do you mean now? <laughs> right. You should be saying the Ukraine if you believe in Ukrainian independence. So just to give you a little bit of an example, it, fortunately, it all papered over, but we didn't get anybody fight or anything. But it was it was a striking uh, kind of incident there, because even among friends who are just relaxing, what words you were using to talk about Ukraine could actually signal, in a sense, how you felt about it. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about, right? Um, to his credit, my Ukrainian friend called out the Russian guy and said, why are you using that way of talking about Ukraine? You know, and oh yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't. It's just the way that, you know, that we all learned it, but it, you know, that I've, I've changed the way that I say it. I mean, because I support Ukraine. And so um, maybe we need to do more of that on a much larger scale looking at the whole history of, uh, of, of, Russian, uh, of Russian culture. What I've been doing in my own work, in my own teaching is that, yes, I'm interrogating some of these older, you know, stuff that I've been teaching my whole life, but I'm also including more voices. I'm including Russian language stories and novels that are by people who are not Russian. Because there's a lot of that. There's a lot of stuff that's been written in Russian because it was an empire that had many, many different people. Russian was the common language. To this day, Russian is spoken in all of these places like Kazakhstan and, and uh, Georgia and places like that. And so, uh, you know, so I'm kind of centering those, those people a little bit more, trying to give a little bit of an imperialistic kind of positioning to this stuff, but, but it's not about banning. Please, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we should ban anything. It's more about reading critically. Yeah, please. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds there, there's that, that that's a complicated question. Thank you. Um, I, I you're kind of you're basically making a, a slippery slope <laughs> argument. You're saying that if we go too far in this critical examining, it's somehow gonna to lead to some kind of censorship. I'm not for censorship. I'm, I'm not for censorship in most things. Your, your question also reminds me of two things. One of them related to comic studies, one of them related to our own sad history. It reminds me to think to the, to the debates from a few years ago about, um, uh, about Confederate monuments, of which there are thousands. I'm, I'm from the South, I'm originally from Texas. So I, I kind of know what I'm talking about here. But um, so there's many, many Confederate monuments. And the argument, right, was that, oh, we can't take them down because we're going to forget our history, which is BS. That's not true at all. Um, in Germany, where I've spent some time, um, they have a prohibition. There's a law in the books against any kind of Nazi memorials, right? And believe me, the, the, the Germans know their history better than any Americans know their history. They know all about the Nazi atrocities. So there's no loss of history. A memorial to a Confederate general is um, like Robert E. Lee. There is a Robert E. Lee school in my hometown in Texas. Um, it, it is not about history. It's about heritage. It's, it's, about sell it, it's about what you choose to honor. It has nothing to do with history. You're not gonna forget who Robert E. Lee was, right? If you remove his monument and if you replace it with a Harriet Tubman monument or so who is frankly more of a real American hero than 
Robert E. Lee was, right? Who, who rebelled against the country and who killed American troops. So, so there is, you know, so that, that's not gonna happen. So it, it's not a question of, of whether we're going to cancel Russian literature or erase Russian literature, even if we wanted to. And I'm not advocating that at all. The other thing that this question reminds me of is something that I deal with in this other part of my work as a comic scholar, and that is the history of superheroes. Um, because the fact is, right, that at the heart of the superhero genre is a very fascistic ideal. The idea that some people are better than others, that they are physical ideals, that they have no imperfections. That's the way kind of classically that they were presented. And in fact, superheroes coming are coming out of a period in American culture, the 1930s, when eugenics were much more in vogue, right? If you all know what eugenics means, it's basically, it literally means good birth. They were policies that were followed, including by many prominent feminists like Margaret Sanger and prominent uh, figures, right, in, in our government, like Woodrow Wilson, who uh, felt that we needed to remove the defects in the population through proper breeding so that um, certain people, say, with disabilities we should not be able to reproduce or we should come up with other ways to, um, to strengthen the gene pool, right? The Nazis pick up on that in a big way, and actually they were very inspired by, by American eugenics movements at that time. Um, and that's what leads to the Holocaust, right? Because that, that's basically what that is, removing this unwanted element from humanity. Superheroes are coming right out of that tradition. That's what Superman literally means, right? A person who is above others. Not only that, but there's also a tradition in superheroes pertaining to their costumes in particular with that, that some scholars have linked to the Klan, to Ku Klux Klan, right? Because the Klan was also this community of people who would put on costumes and save people, you know, for people who believe in the Klan and supported the Klan, they, they were saviors, they weren't monsters. They were people who were saving women from black rapists. That, that was the, the construction of this. So there, there's a lot in the, in the heart of the superhero, the way that it was created that was supremacist. It was white supremacist, it was eugenic. It was leading into some of these strands that would go on to full-blown um, uh, full fascism. So what does that mean though? If we start talking about that, about superheroes, does that mean we're canceling them? Does that mean that we're gonna erase superheroes, that we shouldn't be going to superhero movies or reading superhero texts just because that they have that sordid history? Of course not, of course not. But that doesn't mean that we should ignore it. It shouldn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at it critically and maybe ask ourselves, what is it that I'm looking at when I'm looking at a superhero story? It is about people who are kind of better than us. That's not a very democratic idea. It's saying that some people just by their essence are superior. And there's, like I said, very historical reasons for why it developed that way. Are there ways that we could, you know, maybe push back on that idea, ways that we could alter the genre? That's really all I'm, 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 I'm advocating here is to, to, to critically examine. I am not for erasure, I am not for let me say one more thing about Confederate monuments is that um, what I do think is important is that it should be up to those communities. It shouldn't be outsiders determining it. So if people want to keep their monument somewhere in the South or whatever, I don't think anybody should tell them because we are a free country. And even if you want to believe in horrible racist bullshit, that's your right. Uh, it shouldn't be imposed from outside. But the fact is that I think most people are, are moving past that and are seeing that it is it is a messed up that we shouldn't be, we should never forget that history, but we shouldn't be celebrating those people. That's all, I'm sorry, we're out of time? No, I think so. Okay. Sorry, I give very long answers. <laughs> Hi. La Mosca? The Russian? Yes. Um, may, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a technical question about, I mean, the, the UN does have a legal definition of what a refugee is that you're being, um, and you're right in some, maybe she would be politically persecuted, but, but there's been no history of her being politically persecuted. And we've talked about this because she's always worried about it. <laughs> she's off, but, but she's never actually spent a night in prison or been fined. So that's different from say, if you're a gay person in Russia, 
where you are being, I mean, there you have a legitimate case where you're gonna be maybe killed. That's not, so, so some people are saying she's cheapening the term. You know, that, that's, that's all I'm saying. Okay, thanks a lot guys. All right, see you on the funny papers. Crazy.